Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. Thank you so much. You probably know by now we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is entitled The Role of the Church in the Community. This is lesson number six in that series entitled Jesus Mingled with the People. This lesson is for August 6th of 2016. I think you'll find it very interesting. I hope you have your Bible handy. Let's begin with the word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we wish we could somehow see a recording or perhaps we could be transported back in time and, and watch Jesus and what he did and said and learn from him. But we're thankful for the records that we do have. We look forward to the days in heaven when we will be able to look back at those records and, and see, no doubt, in 3D living color exactly the entire life of Jesus and be continuously amazed by what we see. But now, given what we do know, help us to learn how we can, like Jesus, mingle with the people. Is our prayer today, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, our Bible study guide tells us that over the next several weeks, we're going to talk about ways in which Jesus mingled with the people. He mingled with them, he healed them, he taught them, he asked them to follow him. And it some, seems to suggest that maybe we should do the same thing. There's a little story that starts the lesson out, and I thought maybe it would be good to just briefly read this. A deacon in a local church drove a van that took the youth to an old age home to hold a worship service every month. In the first week, while the youth were leading out, an old man in a wheelchair grabbed the deacon's hand and held it during the service. This happened month after month. One time when the youth group came, the man in the wheelchair was not there. The staff said that he would not li likely live through the night. The deacon went to his room and he was and he was lying there, obviously unconscious. Taking the old man's hand, the deacon prayed that the Lord would grant him eternal life. The seemingly unconscious man squeezed the deacon's hand tightly, and the deacon knew that his prayer had been heard. With tears in his eyes, he stumbled out of the room, bumping into a woman who said, I'm his daughter. He's been waiting for you. My father said, Once a month, Jesus comes and holds my hand and I don't want to die until I have a chance to hold the hand of Jesus one more time. Well, is that the kind of stuff we should be doing? It tells you you never know what people see and feel and even know about you. Uh, whether you're genuine or not, the whole thing, there's so much, and they do absorb yeah. that kind of thing. I can tell you that I have patients that you would think, you know, <laughs> why would you want to have anything to do with these people? Oh, yeah. And on one occasion or another, I'll say, you know, before you get, after I've taken care of them, before you leave, I want to pray for you. And they come back and they will not let me out of the room unless I pray for them again. Yeah, yeah. I had a similar experience with a young white lady. I, ne I don't recall ever seeing her to this day. That mm -hmm. I worked nights at one hospital, I worked at PMs at the other. This day I came into the PM shift and I was in charge. I'd assigned everybody and all the new admits were coming in and this tall, pleasant looking young white lady said, excuse me, do you work here? <laughs> and I said, yes, but you work in another hospital. Yeah, and she says, Thank God, now I know I'll be safe. And that's an exact, mm -hmm. I don't recall seeing her, but yeah. I used to do rounds at night and she must have seen me doing something, I don't know. You never Some, know what they absorb from you. Sometimes it gets a little scary. Yeah. I, had, I had a young lady who was 48 years old. <clears throat> I'm way older than that. She came mm -hmm. in and when I was talking to her and so forth, she <clears throat> says, you cannot die until I die. You have to take care of me until I die. <laughs> I said, hold on just a minute. <laughs> That's a little, a little beyond my capability here, I think. Well, Ellen White puts it in these words, Ministry of Healing 143, paragraph 3. 
Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men and women too, of course, as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bade them, follow me. Would we dare to say, do you know anybody else who said, follow me, or follow my example? Paul. Paul said it several times, didn't he? Yeah. Follow me as I Imitate. follow Jesus. Imitate me as I well, let's analyze that passage for a moment. Jesus, one, mingled with people as one who desired their good. What, what would we call that in modern terms? Networking. Networking, okay. Jesus sympathized with the people. What would we call that? Formed attachments. Yeah. yeah. He, 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 he got his hooks into people, right? <laughs> Jesus ministered to these people, to their needs. That made them even more attached to him. And when he combined the first, second, and third elements, he won people's confidence. Then he bade them what? Follow me. Follow me. Here we see Jesus ministering in the most effective way to the whole person. There was no separation in his thinking between healing, teaching, preaching, evangelizing. It was all one continuous process, right? Well, look at one example in the Bible, the Bible passage that tells us about uh, what Jesus did. It's Philippians 2, and it's, I'm going to read verses 5 to 11. The attitude you should have is the one that Jesus Christ, that Christ Jesus had. He always had the nature of God, but he did not think that by force he should try to remain equal with God. Now, Gary, uh, in a previous lesson you talked about getting in the mud. Do you think Jesus got in the mud? Well, he came to earth, didn't he? Yeah, exactly. What happens if we try to follow his example? Well, we're already on the earth. <laughs> what do we do after that? Well, instead of, of this, of his own free will, he gave up all he had and took the nature of a servant. He became like a human being and appeared in human likeness. He was humble and walked the path of obedience all the way to death, his death on the cross. For this reason, God raised him to the highest place above and gave him the name that is greater than any other name, and so on honor the name of Jesus, all beings in heaven, on earth, and in the world below will fall on their knees and all will openly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord. And when's that going to happen? Not soon enough. <laughs> Not soon enough is right, absolutely. <laughs> well, Jesus left his home in heaven to come down to this earth to teach us what God is like. To actually demonstrate to us what God is like and to answer the questions and accusations that have been raised by the devil. What is that? How, how does that impact us? Or how should it impact us? We should do the same thing. We should do the same thing. Wow. Well, to do that, he had to come into intimate contact with the human race, actually becoming a part of it. He was, however, sinless, as we know. While his genetics had been hurt and damaged by sin along with the rest of ours, he lived, in perfect, he lived a perfect life. In fact, Jesus did not hesitate to mingle with anyone. Can you think of any time in any part of the scripture where Jesus said, well, no, that person is too bad. I, I, I'm not going to touch him or her. What about the lepers? Well, I can remember a mob that he kind of slipped through. Yeah. It was a Kind of an unfavorable mob. That <laughs> he was a little abrupt with the Canaanite woman. That was, he had a purpose in that. Yeah. So that mob that he was referring to, they were not doing what uh, they should have been doing, right? No. So why didn't he just slay them? Do you, do you think that he had a lot of followers? Probably. It, he was revealing the, the character of the father, mm -hmm. okay? And the father didn't kill anybody there. Mm -hmm. And yet, well, couldn't he have manifested some kind of special kindness in some way to these people and thereby convert them? Or <clears throat> Here is someone, let's, let's, just, let's 
try to keep our mind, wrap our minds around this. Here is someone who created the entire universe, including all of us. Now he comes down and says, let me be one of you. Be born as a baby boy. Live in one of the not so nice places in the world. Growing up. So when he was at the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, I have accomplished the work yep. you gave me to do. I have revealed your character. And he could so, have picked a variety of uh, class positions to have. He could have been born in Herod's family. Mm -hmm. Herod had killed him for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, and Jesus, one of the groups he very often had some pretty strong words for were the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the, and the scribes. Look at Luke 15, 1 and 2. One day when many tax collectors and other outcasts came to listen to Jesus, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law started grumbling, and they did that a lot when Jesus was around. This man welcomes outcasts and even eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable, and it turns out it told them three parables. What were the three parables? Lost sheep. The first one was there's a hundred sheep, one gets lost. What does the shepherd do? Go find it. He he locks up his 99 sheep, and then he goes after the one that's lost. Did the sheep know it was lost? Sheep never yes. know they're lost. <laughs> <laughs> well, they had, a pretty, they had a pretty good idea that they weren't with all their buddies like they were supposed to be. I've heard sheep are pretty dumb. Yeah, but at least the sheep, the sheep knew it was lost. You and can, You can tell when they're distressed, but yeah. they haven't got enough sense to get out of it, even right. if it's right there. That so <laughs> the sheep knew it was lost, but it didn't know what to do about it. Okay, then he said, there's a woman who had ten coins, ten silver coins. She lost one. Now, did the, co the silver coin know anything? No. Nothing at all. No knowledge about anything. It just lay there in the dirt until, even so, the, the woman went on an intense search and she found it, didn't she? So, and then in the third case, we have what we have come to call the prodigal son, when at the end of that story, toward the end of that story, did he, did he know he was in trouble? Yeah. He recognized, and did he know what to do? He knew what to do, didn't he? So you, you got just about every kind of situation covered, don't you? And Jesus, and at the end of every one of these things, at, well, at the beginning there was something lost, and at the end of every one, there was a celebration, wasn't there? So that comes right after he was mingling with these tax collectors and whatever. Yep, he was still mingling. He was telling the story as he's eating with them. So do you think they were getting the message? Are these people lost, like, like, like the um, parables are saying? Or are these people something you don't want to touch because you might get it contaminated. That's what the Pharisees thought, wasn't it? But if it was that way, it seems like his stories would be a little different. But he's making the point that these people are lost mm -hmm. and they need to be found they, again. They were lost based on the Pharisees' evaluation of them. Because he's not saying this to the people. I, they may have been listening, I don't know, but he's speaking to the Pharisees. <coughs> okay? And these people were lost. So. Okay, go ahead. Who are the Pharisees, scribes, and Sadducees today? Hmm. You're trying to get me in trouble. You're getting trying to get our program <laughs> thrown off the air here, or what? <coughs> I, I'm being serious. <coughs> Is it us? Well. We that's, are, that's safe to admit. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's me. It's me. Okay. <laughs> I think there's a little bit of that in all of us. Yeah. Yes, I would agree. Well, we are sometimes called the Laodiceans. Where would they fit into this story? In the shower? Neither the hot nor cold. They're the sheep. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. Uh, I've twice visited that valley where Laodicea is located. And it talks, the hot or the cold is an interesting situation because on one side of the valley there's a whole bunch of hot springs at a place called Hierapolis. On the other, down the valley the other direction a little ways, there's a, 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 
a, a town, was, it's not a town anymore, but there used to be a, a town, Colossi, was right at the foot of a tall mountain that had, you know, cold water running from, from glaciers right out of it every, all the time. So there's beautiful running streams. Of, the, 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 the river's still there, right, running right by them. It was beautiful cold water out of the mountain. And, and Laodicea didn't have either one of those things. They had to get water from one side or the other, and wherever they got it from, by, by the time they got it to Laodicea, it was lukewarm. So, well, here's the story. The stories we can learn some interesting things. A pastor was following up a voice of prophecy interest and discovered that the whole family was interested in Bible studies except one of the members. The mother, father, and younger daughter had accepted Christ and were eager to receive the pastor in their home on a regular basis. The older son had rebelled against Christianity and wanted nothing to do with it. Every evening that the pastor visited, the young man left the room, would not participate in the lesson studies. After six weeks of cordial and productive Bible study, the young pastor began to challenge the three who were studying with him to consider baptism. Each had his, his or her own reason why he or she should wait a few months before deciding. Unexpectedly, the young man entered the dining room where the study was in session and announced that he wanted to be baptized as soon as the pastor felt he was ready. He had been sitting in his room following along in a Bible he had purchased at a used bookstore after the first lesson and all along was growing in, a, in conviction that he needed to make a public confession of his faith. Two weeks later, the young man was baptized, and one month after that, the rest of the family took their stand as well. Considering what we just read in the parables, we can imagine that there was joy in heaven over these decisions. So, what do we learn from that story? It can be unexpected. You never know exactly. I gave Bible studies, it's a long story, but I gave Bible studies to this three in the family, and uh, the husband was not interested, but he's the first one that wanted baptism. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Turned are. out. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I've told this story before, but I'll tell it just briefly again now, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give all the details, but on one occasion while I was attending a public university, doing a master's degree, I was invited by one of my instructors to attend a cocktail party. Well, I was just ready to say immediately no. He says, oh, don't worry. He says, there will be, there will be soda and water to drink. We're not, you're not expecting everybody to drink alcohol. And uh, he said, we'd like you to come and bring your family. Well, without going into a lot of detail, that night I met, my wife and I were there. We ran into this lady who asked us, some startling questions I didn't expect, and I was trying to answer the questions, and that woman ended up being a professor at Loma Linda University. Excellent. Because I went to a cocktail party. So you never know <laughs> what's gonna happen. And what kind of people did Jesus hang out with? Do you remember what it says specifically? Sinners. Tax collectors. Look at Luke 8. Sometime later, Jesus traveled through towns and villages preaching the good news about the kingdom. The 12 disciples went with him. We know about that. And so did some women who had been healed of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had been driven out. Joanna, whose husband Chusa was an officer at Herod's court. And Susanna and many other women who used their own resources to help Jesus and his disciples. Um... What do you think if your pastor's hanging out with a formerly demon-possessed prostitute and so forth? Sound like a good idea? Wouldn't look good. <laughs> well? I think that it's very possible that we are just as judgmental as, the, as they were in Jesus' time. Yeah. And if one of the pastoral staff, or even any of us, started hanging out on a regular basis with people that um, are colorful, shall we say. <laughs> um, I guess it's a know, good thing they don't know what I do. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, you know, I think that, I think some people might raise their eyebrows and mm -hmm. wonder about that. However, if I'm solid enough in my faith and what I'm doing and I'm not going to be drawn into all of these other problems that are going on over there 
then hopefully in the long run they'll figure out that you know this was an attempt at yeah but I'm, I'm I'm kind of want to play it safe with you and tell you to stay away from those people because <laughs> I don't want you to fall into those problems am I, I doing see. a good thing <laughs> Well, have, have, <laughs> have, have you ever avoided trying to witness to somebody because you can't figure out how they would fit into your church? Mm. Mm. No, there was I, this. I've known one or two people who've entered a church, signed on to a church that I knew, and I've often wondered how they got on. Mm -hmm. Having known them before they were Adventists, I thought, boy, that might be a problem. Can happen. Do we need more grace to accept sinners? Yes. Yes, we do, yes. And here's a challenge in our part of the world, for sure, and it may, even worse, now, some other parts of the world. How do you witness to someone who doesn't, whose primary language is not your language? You say, sorry, I can't witness to you because you don't speak my language? Well, you do the best you can. Take you somebody know. along with you that speaks that language. Okay. You know, uh, your actions say Your actions, kindness, that, that, that goes right through any language, mm -hmm. you, anywhere. You need to be patient, too, because yeah. there is a, uh, there is an outward, tangible, physical growth that occurs along with a cleaning up, along with the spiritual. And, uh, it can take uh, it can take some time. So somebody who comes in new, from we'll use the term very primitive spiritual experience, yes. um, just because they're converted doesn't mean you know they're they're just as it's pretty as what we would like them to eventually come become. Okay. And and. Uh, we need to be willing to accept, accept that, you know, they're growing. I once upon a time was a call porter for a summer. It was a very <coughs> interesting experience. Um, I worked with the gentleman, or, or he worked with me, tried to do something with me, and he wasn't too successful at it. <laughs> he tried to work with me, but he told a story about someone that he had worked with down in Texas. Or in, actually not worked with. He, came to this church and found out there was one person in that church which was, who was very successful at winning people. The man was nearly blind, elderly, and what he would do, and you could do this better in some communities than you could in other communities, he would go around with like a copy of Great Controversy or a copy of Desire of Ages, and he'd knock on people's doors and he would say, you know, I can hardly read. I, I, my eyes are really bad. Would you mind taking a few minutes and read to me out of this book? Very and he, good. And he would start asking questions. Mm -hmm. What do you think that means? Why does it say that? You mean he was faking that? No. <laughs> oh, no. Okay, okay, I get it. <laughs> he, was, he was real. You, you know, know? I, I, I was acquainted distantly with, uh, you may remember when you and I were young, yes. they had these tape recorders that would play the music and then there was a Bible study and then you could turn the film strip oh, thing. Yeah. Yes. And there was a gentleman who was severely handicapped. And uh, he just starts setting up chairs out in his front yard, kind of like a drive-in theater. Uh -huh. <laughs> and people came and, and watched these things. And, I mean, he, could, he himself had a severe, severe physical speech impediment. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, got, he got, uh, brought people to the Lord with that. Wow. Okay, well, here's an example of what Jesus did. Matthew 9, starting with verse 10. While Jesus was having a meal in Matthew's house, many tax collectors and other outcasts came and joined Jesus and his disciples at the table. Some Pharisees saw this and asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with such people? Jesus heard them and answered, People who are well do not need a doctor, but only those who are sick. Go and find out what is meant by the scripture that says, it is kindness that I want, not animal sacrifices. I have not come to call respectable people, but outcasts. So does that mean that we should focus all our attention on the worst people of all? We shouldn't bother with rich people or middle class people. 
people from all stratas of life have problems. Some mm -hmm. just hide it a bit better than others here and there, or have the money to do so. It, it, it's pretty clear that religious ceremonialism is not going to get us very far. Well, I tell you, it's, it's not easy to do that. Um, I remember up north, I belonged to a church, and this, this gal came in. She wanted to, to visit and was interested in coming there, and she had, she had these uh, western boots with high heels and very gangly, you know, and, and long hair. Uh, it smelt a little bit like smoke you know, because her family probably smoked and everything, and, and she just didn't know the Adventist culture at all. I mean, she was just didn't fit. And she came into the church, and, and everybody was patient with her for about two weeks. <laughs> and then, then the old lady started working on her, and after a while, well, she was gone. So. I will tell you another story. This, this lesson can sure not be a lesson full of stories. <laughs> there was a man who came in looking about like that, wearing beat up old jeans and so forth, and a baggy shirt and so forth. And he came in, but the church, this particular church, accepted him and tried to be nice. They tried to help him out and give him some clothes and all this kind of stuff. And finally, he said, You know, I'd really like to become a member of this church and so forth. And you all treated me so well. And they said, Well, come, you know, talk to the pastor, make arrangements. And the next Sabbath, he showed up in a business suit. Uh huh. <laughs> yes, he, he was. No. Well, he no. He was. He was a very. He was a very good businessman. Well off, on a good home. He just wanted to find out whether this church oh, was okay. genuine. Oh, that's right. He was checking it out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a little sneaky. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, well. What kind of people do we consider to be undesirable? Would we welcome prisoners, ex-prisoners, criminals, drug addicts? Pedophiles, I'm not too sure. Pedophiles, smokers, alcoholics. Sometimes it's hard to remember that every one of these people are children of the heavenly king. When Jesus quoted Hosea 6.6, 6, which is what I just read a moment ago in Matthew, and reminded the religious leaders that he came to save sinners, how sad it was that he had to remind those religious leaders of one of the most important aspects of their faith. Weren't they supposed to be reaching out to the world and winning them for Jesus? How many Christians today believe that some form of religious ceremonialism, such as attending church regularly and maybe even prayer meeting on Wednesday nights, is going to save them? I, can, I know one very popular church that people get the idea that if you come on Easter and Christmas, you're it's about all you really need to do, right? Well, Ellen White says, thousands are making the same mistake as did the Pharisees whom Christ reproved at Matthew's feast. Rather than give up some cherished idea or discard some idol of opinion, many refuse the truth which comes down from the Father of light. They trust in self and depend upon their own wisdom and do not realize their spiritual poverty. They insist on being saved in some way by which they may perform some important work. When they see that there is no way of weaving self into their work, they reject the salvation provided. And then she goes on to say, Desire of Ages 280, paragraph 1 and 2, a legal religion can never lead souls to Christ, for it is a loveless, Christless religion. Fasting or prayer that is actuated by a self-justifying spirit is an abomination in the sight of God. Wow. So what's a, what's a legal religion? A legal religion? Mm -hmm. That's wow. where you where you think if you do certain things, then you're going to uh, you meet the be entitled to walk into heaven. You can just you go right up there and nobody can keep you up. You meet the requirements of the law, right? <coughs> mm -hmm. Well, most people who do that, they, they figure out these rules for themselves and they, they kind of follow them very carefully and um, never really, it never really comes out naturally. It's, it's always, you know, this rule, I'm going to follow this rule, and how well did I do this today, and that kind of thing. Well, that, that isn't, in, in <laughs> that's going to get old real fast. In the book Christ Object Lessons, page 97, 
at the bottom, Ellen White says these words, some really scary words. The man who attempts to keep the commandments of God, and don't we all think that's required, from a sense of obligation merely because he is required to do so, will never enter into the joy of obedience. He does not obey. When the requirements of God are accounted a burden because they cut across human inclination, we may know that the life is not a Christian life. True obedience is the outworking of a principle within. Uh, it springs from the love of righteousness, the love of the law of God, the essence of all righteousness. Now, we've been talking about that for several weeks. The essence of all righteousness is what? Loyalty to our Redeemer. This will lead us to do right because it is right, because right doing is pleasing to God. So... What is the joy in obedience? What is the joy well, uh, of obedience? You know, uh, obey to me sounds like you're doing the very thing we were talking about, being legal. That's I mean, when you, when you um, follow the law, you're obeying the law, you know, type of thing. And yet she's using that word the other way, that when you obey the law because of oblig you feel obligated to do it, or else maybe you won't get saved. Mm -hmm. That uh, you're not a Christian. That's not. That's not the goal. Basically, what she's saying is, if we're really going to serve God, we need to study His Word until we realize that He never asks us to do something which was not for our best good. So when we when we reach that place, I mean, I can I can imagine a lot of people who might eventually be saved under maybe not the very best circumstances. And after they've been in heaven for a little while, going up to God and say, God, you know what? I would do everything you asked me to do now, even if you didn't ask me to, because it's the right thing to do. That word that is translated as obedience comes from the Greek word hupakoi, meaning a willingness to listen, Humble to take instruction. To if you go through the Old Testament, God is complaining to the people, don't listen. Mm -hmm. They don't take instruction. And uh, what else can you do with people who are <laughs> unwilling to learn and take so instruction? Obey, in the right sense, is a synonym for being humble. Uh, being humble, but, but I, I, what I get, you know, when, with the word sometimes, the guy with the whip, obey! Yeah. You know, like this, go pick that up, you know, type of thing. And that's, that's what I get with that word. Now, yeah. you know, things that's why change. That's why it's come to have a completely wrong meaning on lots of minds. Mm -hmm. So how can we, as Seventh-day Adventists, mingle wisely? Think of the members of your church. How many of them have significant numbers of non-Adventist friends? Not just acquaintances or maybe fellow workers, although some of them might be fellow workers. How do you mingle wisely? <clears throat> That's why I just asked you. I know. <laughs> well, it depends on... And I, it was like you had the answer. I was, I was waiting for it. You know, you, the answer to that question is going to depend on um, what community you live in. There, there are people yeah. who are l listening to this broadcast and listening to answer that question, and <clears throat> they may have they may have hardly no Adventists. If they live in a small community where there's a very small church, they may have hardly any Adventist acquaintances. Mm -hmm. They may mingle most of their days, most of their time with uh, members who are not. And hopefully they're, they're thinking of ways and, and taking advantage of opportunities to witness. It is so easy for us as human beings to surround ourselves with those who think like we do eat what we eat, worship like we do, etc. And fall off the same cliff. Yeah, how can, but how can we reach out to sinners if we do not associate with them? This is a lot of trouble you're you can, prescribing here. Oh, yes, it is a lot of trouble. Figure out what you're going to say. And but what did Jesus mean when he said we're supposed to be lights and we're supposed to be salt? That's not easy either. I think we you, dealt with it earlier. As a new friend over here said, if you study, 
you've got, it's like putting an armor on in, in, in the biblical sense. Mm -hmm. You can mix with people. You don't have to absorb their habits. And a lot of them will appreciate <coughs> the fact that you even took the time to, to mingle with them. I don't think you should stick your neck out and, and, and get into some of these places where there's a whole lot of stuff going on that nobody could hear you if they wanted to. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's like yeah. Gordon, though. I, you know, I play it safe with him. I just treat him as a human being, you know, <laughs> and not, not take in were. some of his habits or even like to do some of his habits. And, and so I <laughs> do, do you have to feel like you have to be able to give uh, Bible studies in order to, to witness? Not initially. No. Well, well, no, wait a minute. I didn't say anything about initially. <laughs> I said, do you feel like you have to at all? Well, unfortunately, the Bible gives us some examples of very sad experiences. Look at Lot. What happened to him and his family? Yeah. He mingled. I spent most of my <laughs> <laughs> No, that's true. And what, ab what about the, the people, the Israelites at Baal Peor? I spent a major part of my professional life working amongst non-Adventists. Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about that. They ask you. Mm -hmm. You can stand your ground. I always said I don't smoke, I don't drink, and I have certain dietary preferences and all that. People would come up on the quiet. I think you're right. I don't think I can do it, though. But you're yeah. right. I, I spent, I've spent hours here and there over the years when there was a quiet time. Even patients that I had, some of the most mentally disturbed patients, you take them to Scripture, they know the Bible. You look at them and think, what happened here? Mm -hmm. Somebody tried. It, it comes up. You don't have to look for it. You can answer questions and mingle with people. It's sort of... They want to talk to you more often than not. Ellen White put it in these words, Now, shall professed Christians refuse to associate with the unconverted and seek to have no communication with them? No, they are to be with them in the world and not of the world, but not to partake of their ways, not to be impressed by them, not to have a heart open to their customs and practices. Their associations are to be for the purpose of drawing others to Christ. Select Messages, Book 3, page 231, paragraph 2. So how many non adventist friends do you have? What kind of relationship do you have with them? Are you influenced by them? Are you influencing them for the gospel? Or are they influencing you for the world? And there's where the mingle wisely comment yes. that you had earlier it comes in. This is a very challenging question. It must be answered on an individual level. What could we as church members of Sabbath school class members do to reach out to others? Well, when we consider our relationships with others, it is easy for us to think that we need to share our faith. Isn't that what we think? In fact, everything we have that is worth sharing, we have received, been given by Jesus Christ. And he said in Matthew 10, 8, freely ye have received, freely give. So look at Philippians 2, 13 to 15. Because God is always at work in you to make you willing and able to obey his own purpose. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may be innocent and pure as God's perfect children who live in a world of corrupt and sinful people. You must shine among them like stars lighting up the sky. Does that sound like let your light so shine? Yeah. You know, we're not light bulbs. What are you talking about? I'm talking about being witnesses. Being witnesses mm -hmm. by shining a light. Mm -hmm. That's the language you're using there, but what does it mean? Well, like, like Carrie, I work with mostly non-Adventists every day in a medical setting and most of them we have a few Adventists but most of them are not Adventists because we can't find Adventists who meet all our criteria particularly the fact that we have they have to be bilingual because of our clientele we're taking care of we have to be able to speak English and Spanish but we're all, always looking for people like that but it's not easy to find them everybody wants them and that's part of the problem 
But so every once in a while they do things and, well, why do you do that? And what are you supposed to say when they ask that kind of a question? Well, you have to answer their question. Of course. And it can be quite simple. You don't have mm -hmm. to get like a dictionary or something. It depends on the depth of what they ask you and under what circumstance. So, so what, what is this light bulb business? How does that relate to this? Well, you're, sh you're sharing the light. Sharing the light? Mm hmm So the truth is the light. Yes. The truth is the light. So, Gordon, if somebody asks you why you're a vegetarian, just out of the blue, what would you tell them? Mm -hmm. I've been asked that many times. Yeah, me too. What did you tell them? For health. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, and it I is. try to go through a little bit more of it with them, especially you know, some of the folks that I work with. Most of them are not Adventists, even though I work in an Adventist institution. Right. Mm -hmm. It's healthy. You feel um, better. You live longer. There's all kinds of things you can say. And I, I, I have a number of young ladies that I work with, because a lot of them, that's the people who we can get, who is be, are bilingual, fluently bilingual, willing to work as nursing assistants and so forth like that. And they just tell me, they try it. I have several of them who said, you know, I've tried to do this, be a vegetarian, so, and you feel a lot better, and you have more energy, and you sleep better. Hmm, isn't that interesting? I wonder how that happened. <laughs> <laughs> you know? What do you need to, you, you don't need to, let them tell you. So what do you mean by vegetarian? What does that mean? What'd you say? Well, I mean, it depends. When people ask me that question, I, I play a little bit tricky. They ask, they, why, do you, why are you vegetarian? I, I say, my father was a doctor. Yeah. That's, uh, you know. Well, some people that think that vegetarians can eat fish. I mean, a fish I is know. a vegetarian. You can is work. A, and you can so get, how do you know what, you, what well, they're talking about? What you're talking I, about when you say vegetarian. The, the teacher that I had that really taught me the most about the Bible, when someone would ask him, are you a Seventh-day Adventist? His response was, well, you tell me what you think one of those is, and then I'll tell you if I am one. There you go. <laughs> that's what you, sometimes that's what you need to do. That's a good point. You ask a lot of Adventists what one is, and, and yeah. you'll, you'll get surprised yourself. Well, in his book, Jay, there's someone here by your name. <laughs> Robert Linthicum in his book, Empowering the Poor, in which he described three different kinds of churches. Now, try to think what kind of, which one of these churches do you belong to? He's not an Adventist, I don't think. No. First, the church in the city or in the community has virtually no contact with the community. The bulk of the church's emphasis is on serving its members' needs. Okay. Two. Then there's a church to the city or community. This church knows that it must get involved in ministry to the community. That's part of its goals. Uh, it guesses what the community needs. Without consulting the community, it serves. Then it presents programs to the community. Its ministry risks being irrelevant with no community ownership. Last, Linthicum speaks of the church with the community, with the city or community. This church does a demographic analysis to understand those whom it serves. Now, you don't have to be really scientific about this. You can just go out there and mix with the people and learn what kind of, what are their needs, what are their problems. Members mingle with leaders and residents of the community, asking them what their real needs are. Their service to the community is more likely to be relevant and well-received because the community has already given input and trust the process. This church joins the community in their struggle to decide what kind of community they want and is a partner with the community toward realizing their goal or that goal. Such a church gets involved with community organizations and may help the community to add lacking services, if needed. There's a mutual ownership and buy-in of this partnership to meet real needs. Could we do that? And what kind of a church do we belong to? Well, then there's the government that wants to take over all that. Yeah. Give everybody a, give everybody a check. Well, is, is the church like a, a bus? You just get on, you wait for it to arrive at the kingdom? For some people, yes. Mm -hmm. If well, you study hard enough, you realize that's not exactly the case. Didn't work quite like that? Well, I wonder if anybody has taken a survey 
Years ago, right here at Loma Linda, I was taking a class once, and uh, and we made a particular brochure that included all the activities of our church, mm -hmm. all the outreach mm -hmm. uh, events. And uh, we just go door to door and leave it and say, we're going to be back in about 10 minutes. Go through this and check the things that you would like to see us do. Mm -hmm. And if you have another one, put it down. And we had a good response. I don't know mm -hmm. if you've done that lately. In Not this recently. Mm -hmm. But we found out what the needs were, and they could, uh, then we could minister to those. Yeah. Well, the church is not just here in the world to wait for Jesus to come back. <clears throat> it has a mission to accomplish. In fact, we've had some very vigorous discussions about this in the past, but look at 2 Peter 3, 10 to 12. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day, the heavens will disappear with a shrill noise, the heavenly bodies will burn up and be destroyed, and the earth with everything in it will vanish. Since all these things will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people should you be? Your lives should be holy and dedicated to God as you wait for the day of God and do your best to make it come soon. The day when the heavens will burn up and be destroyed and the heavenly bodies will be melted by the heat. But we wait for what God has promised, new heavens and new earth, where righteousness will be at home. So do we have anything to do with hastening the second coming? One, we say slowing it down. Or slowing it down? <laughs> Why are we still here 170, almost 172 years after the great disappointment? Almost 200 before you know it. One Christian church has an interesting sign as one leaves the parking lot. This is not when you come into the parking lot. As you leave the parking lot, and it says, Servant's Entrance. I like that. What does that mean? It's time to go out and serve the world. I've seen one that said, mission, let's see, your mission begins here when you leave. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As we move out into the world, do we recognize that we are servants of the Lord reaching out to a hurting world? One Adventist author has said these words, there is no call here to hibernate in the wilderness evangelizing jackrabbits. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. We can understand that here, can't we? Here is an awesome invitation given by the prophet of the Lord to mingle like Jesus with the unlovely, the poor, and the lost. Jesus was friends with sinners. He attended their parties, met them where they were. Jesus never compromised his faith, but he loved to go where there were sinners. The people most comfortable around Jesus were sinners, while the ones most uncomfortable were the so-called saints. But Jesus didn't pay attention to that because he had his priorities straight. He came to save sinners. That was his mission, and it should be our mission even if we make some saints upset. Well, I feel very comforted by that. It seems like in my life I've always attracted the derelicts and the riffraff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. For too long, Adventists have isolated themselves in safe havens and ghettos as if the rest of the world did not exist. That time has ended. We cannot, we dare not, live in apostasy any longer. It is time to enter the community as individuals and as a church. Russell Burrell, How to Grow an Adventist Church. Is it really true that if we isolate ourselves away from the world and refuse to reach out to others, we are in apostasy? Well, exactly. that's a pretty strong word. <laughs> I mean, to be a hermit? <coughs> well, again, I ask the question, if the guy who lives across the street from you is going to be lost if you don't witness to him, would you witness? Man, I don't know how in the world you make that judgment. That anybody I'm not asking lost. you to make the judgment. I'm no, just asking you to, I'm I'm asking saying, you to think about it. I, I'm thinking about it, but, but every time I think about it, I'm thinking I'm making a judgment on this. <laughs> That's what hits me first. <laughs> okay. So are you telling me that I have to do something besides go to Sabbath school and church and study the Bible and come to a good theological opinions and have a good basis for those? I have to do something more than that? I firmly believe, I will tell you an honest fact, I firmly believe that when you do that, you will be compelled to share it with others. You'll be so excited yeah. about what you learn that you just have to share it. Right. So it's not 
not enough just to have a right picture of God. We have to share it. Paul said, I am a slave. What did he mean when he said, I'm a slave? And he lived in a society where there were lots of slaves. What he meant was, the fire in me that burns in there, my, my desire to share the gospel is burning so hard, I can't keep quiet about it. That makes him a slave? That's what I he don't said. I understand that. Well, well, I don't know if you're interpreting it. He, he was, he, <laughs> no, he, he, well, he goes on to read, read it for yourself. He said, I can't keep quiet. I'm, I'm a slave to this compulsion to speak the gospel, to speak the truth, to reach out. He said, because of what I did to Christians in the early days, I feel now I can't keep quiet. I have to, I, and, and my excitement about the gospel as I understand it, I have to talk to people about it. So when I come here and participate in this broadcast, I'm, that's kind of what I'm doing, right? Good. That's a good start. And I'm, I'm affecting maybe millions of people. I hope so. Yeah, it's always just a start. So all I have to do is just <laughs> come here. It, if you're not prepared to share, it seems oh, to me start. it indicates that you don't value it that much. Yeah. Well, I what? think of it as a three-legged stool. Study, prayer, and share yeah. must be combined in the lifestyle of every member. And if one is missing, the whole thing falls apart. And a lot of people say, well, why can't I just pray and study? That's all I need. Well, the answer is this, in my opinion. <clears throat> my opinion is this. If you haven't figured it, out, figured it out what you believe well enough so that you can explain it to somebody else, you don't understand it. So you need, it's not because that person needs your sharing, although they may, Gary. The guy across the street might need your sharing, but you do need it. I do need it? Yes, you do need it. There's no greater joy that can come to yeah. one that's greater than when you're sharing your faith and you see response. Mm -hmm. You see God changing other lives through you. To me, that's, yeah. that yeah, brings you the modest, uh, greatest joy. Yeah. You receive the joy of salvation. How many Adventist churches spend more time arguing than they do than on re-outreach. <laughs> Don't ask. Yeah. It, it happens more. Oh, sorry, I just did. It happens more than it should. It should be very clear in the lessons we've studied so far in this, less, in this series that Jesus never intended for us to live in an isolated spiritual bubble. What active steps can we take to think outside the box, move outside the box, and witness outside the box? How can we make friends of non-believers? What are the pros and cons of isolating ourselves in an Adventist community? Okay, what are the pros and cons of isolating ourselves in an Adventist community? Well, the pros would be like when, um, when the Israelites were staying into themselves and encouraging and supporting each other and that. That, that would be your pro, but the con is you're just getting incestuous in terms of your ideas and your thoughts and your and how you're, <coughs> you're doing all of that. <coughs> and if you spend so much time trying to do things out into the community, re outreach, all these kinds of things, and I'm not taking care of my own spiritual walk, uh -huh. then I'm. It, it's a balance issue. Are there are there places and people that Christians should avoid? Well, I can tell you there's some places and people that I would not be going making home visits to, but <laughs> I yeah. But in a safe setting, I think that we can reach out to anyone. I think it was last week in this discussion you said something like um, Israel was told to not take up the, the the religion of the other people, but otherwise they were supposed to be mingle with them. Yes. Isn't that what you said? Mhm. Mm well, that's the, that's the advantage of being together, you know, Adventists coming together because, you know, you can find a job where you don't have to work on Saturday. You can always find vegetarian restaurants and, you know, the church is all around that area or Seventh-day Adventists. You can go to any, any one. You won't run into any problem with, with um, arguments Those that are the you were pros. talking about. Those are the pros. <laughs> That's the pros. The cons might be that as long as we keep doing that, we'll be here forever on planet Earth. Well, maybe the, the little community will just grow. 
metastasize. Somebody. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not a very fast way to get the job done. Yeah. You put it so nicely. <laughs> <laughs> well how, how, how comfortable do you feel in reaching out to non-Adventists? Do you have a, an emotional response? Ooh. Is that what comes to your mind when you consider the possibility of witnessing? Sociologists have studied human behavior, who studies human, human behavior, tell us that if you form a committee to do something, if you get a lot of people who are from the same kind of background and think the same, they'll be very comfortable. They'll all be happy. They'll come to, result, come to the conclusion pretty easily. And they'll all be happy about the conclusion. <coughs> but if you find a bunch of, put a bunch of people together who are very different, come from different backgrounds and so forth, they will come up with much better answers to the problems, but not nearly, none of them will be really happy about it. So <laughs> what does that teach us? Well, if we fear spending time with non adventists because they might ask questions about our diet, our Sabbath, or our beliefs, maybe the problem is we haven't spent enough time with scriptures and we're not so sure about what we'd say. An influential French philosopher by the name of Jacques Derrida suggested that whenever we come in contact with someone or something outside our normal range of experience, it will provide us a, a possible opportunity to learn and grow. In his description of this, he called it eating well. The problem is you just want to make sure that you're not so taken in by it that you're eaten. So in considering our lesson for this Sabbath, are we afraid to approach others because we're not well, well founded in our faith? Is that the problem? We, we shouldn't remember Revelation 18 that says, come out of her, my people, right? So where's the right balance? How do we know just exactly what to do? Well, it's not going to be the same for everybody. But what, what I can guarantee you is you won't feel comfortable reaching out to non-Adventists and sharing your faith until you try it. And the more you try it, the easier it will become. Yes. So my challenge to you out there is, think about this. Talk about it in your Sabbath school class. What can you do to reach out to the people around you and say something good about Jesus Christ? Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is for us to gather in this group and talk about you. We think of all those others who might be listening in might have an opportunity to discuss it in their classes. May you be with them as well. And may we all do our part to bring that day very soon so that you can come again as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.